Welcome, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Joe and I will take you through the uh, presentation of the numbers. Uh, you should be able to see some slides as we go through. We'll try and keep this moving at a bit of a pace so that we've got time for some questions at the end. Uh, so maybe first I'll introduce uh, the results and hand you over to Jog. I think the things I'd like to say as we start is we feel we've got a good set of results here. They're in line with consensus. Uh, what you'll see is a period of margin progression, um, but also a period of consolidation and a reduction of change in the uh, business as we've begun to get to scale and get the portfolio that we've been looking for. Uh, there's a period of good growth. Uh, we've got a, an issue to discuss over foreign exchange. Um, underlying growth at a factory level and site level in, in the countries has been uh, exceedingly encouraging. Um, and on that basis, I'll turn over to Jog to get into some of the details. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm on slide four and just talking about the financial highlights. You'll see the revenue's grown 2% in sterling terms, and that's 12% on the constant currency basis. Uh, the profit has grown 30%, um, and on a constant currency basis, is 46% growth. Uh, there have been forex head winds that have caused us translation pressure, and I'll talk about them a little later uh, in the presentation. Um, also during the period, you'll see that the margin has improved from 4.6% to 5.9%. I'm delighted with that, and there is more margin growth to come, and we'll explain how that is going to be achieved. The cash generation is solid. It's back to normal levels. Um, FY14 was a little weaker. It was a 45% conversion for the full year uh, of FY14. My longer term target, certainly for FY15 and 16, was to be at 70% cash conversion on HOP. And you can see we've delivered that. And that's particularly pleasing for me because that's against the backdrop of pressure from our clients, which again, I'll cover a little later in the deck. Net cash has gone down as a result of our investment activities. We've done a four separate M&A deals and invested money in R&D CapEx. The adjusted earnings per share has moved to 7.56 pence per share for the H1 period. That's down in sterling terms 1%. Uh, uh, in sterling terms 1%, but if you look at it on a constant currency basis, is up almost 10%. Uh, and that's particularly pleasing because that's against a drag of uh, excess cash sitting on the balance sheet and uh, not the most most efficient balance sheet because we're completely unleveraged at the moment. I turn the side to side five. Uh, if I put the results in context, 2014 for us on the depot side of the business was around centralizing it and getting her consistency of operation across all the different 15 countries that we were in. 2015 on the depot side of the business about consolidating what we've got and letting the profit from those operations start to come through. And you can start to see that come through through an uptick in the margin, which will continue, I believe, out to H215 at least. In 2014, we acquired Blanco, which is the software business. It was our first entry into software. Um, it was a big acquisition for us, and I'm pleased to say it's landed well, and Matthew will touch on that a little later. 2015 has been about integrating that into Regenesis, and that's gone well. 2016 is now about uh, taking the portfolio that we've built and developed during the course of 2015, and you'll see uh, a growth in the profit and the profit margins as a result of these profits now starting to come through. I'll pass back to Matthew now. Talk about the margin. Very good. Uh, on slide six, I want to talk a little bit about the margin. I think for us, this is uh, perhaps one of the largest parts of the story and certainly a good way to introduce what's happening at a divisional level. Um, very pleasingly, in this set of results, the software and advanced solutions side of the business has become the largest part of the business. You can see on those pie charts, it's now 58% of the profitability uh, of the group. And not only is it the largest part of the business, it's the fastest growing part of the business, and it's also the part of the business with the highest margins. Um, so there's a virtuous uh, move here in the mix um, when it comes to the operating profit margins. And, and let me just show you how that works. If we work around uh, the charts on this page, you'll see that uh, currently and partly as a result of the Blanco acquisition, um, the software and advanced solutions uh, margins are showing uh, 20%, just over 20%. Uh, that's some four times the size of what we've been achieving um, in the depot business. And so uh, it's on the advanced solutions and software side of the business, 
you've got a story which is much more driven um, around operating profit growth than it is revenues. The revenues uh, represent a, a much smaller part of the group as a whole. What that's meant um, in this half, the first half of 2015, compared to the first half of 2014, is the hot margins or the operating margins um, at, a, uh, at a group level and after head office costs have moved from 4.6% to 5.9%, a, a reasonably significant move, and I believe the start of a trend. Um, certainly if you're in receipt of analyst consensus numbers, uh, you'll see that they're calling for uh, margins at that level of 7% odd for the year as a whole. Uh, so through that, I think you can anticipate, or at least see that they're anticipating a second half uh, with higher margins still. Uh, and as I say, we'd expect that to be something uh, you should see unfolding over the next uh, few periods. Uh, I'll dive straight into uh, each of the divisions um, because some of this on slide seven is a little repetitive. Uh, but first mention uh, what we're thinking in terms of the strategy as a whole. Um, the group is uh, now delivering um, a good upward profit margin trend. It's something we set out to achieve uh, right at the beginning of this strategy uh, three and a half years ago. It's pleasing to see it finally coming through as we've been able to build through both acquisition and organic growth uh, the advanced solutions and software side of the business. On the depot side of the business, uh, the focus there has been, a, been in building ourselves the geographic footprint to get to the front of our competitive group and make sure that the clients see us as, uh, as a supplier that they have to go to. I think we've achieved that. We've certainly, in our mind, achieved market leadership in the European territory. And we're seen now today in Depot as one of the four market leaders globally. Um, the trend for that business is one of reduced change as we've hit that point of market leadership and got the footprint in place um, and not needing to respond to competitive pressures in terms of the footprint itself. I think you'll see a period of 12 or 18 months uh, where the depot business will mature out and we'll see uh, better, better profits coming through as a result of a reduction in change in that business. So turning over to the page, I will talk um, to software and advanced solutions and, and run through the key parts of that business. Uh, front of everybody's mind is the Blanco acquisition, which Job referred to. It was a sizable acquisition. Uh, we paid 60 million euros uh, for the business. Um, that has uh, integrated into the business very well. Uh, the original founder has stayed with us over the course of what's now 11 months since we bought it, which has been pleasing and helpful. Uh, we have very recently hired a new chief executive who's joined us uh, in the US um, to help build and run that software side of the business. Um, our clear market leadership in the, ter in the sector um, uh, remains, uh, and we believe the sector dynamics uh, remain extremely favourable. Uh, growth has been good, and I think at the top end of our expectations um, for an integration process, 2014 calendar year, year on year versus 2013, uh, we've seen revenue growth of about 20%. I think it's fair to say that the back end of that 2014 period was seeing accelerating uh, growth rates. So uh, there's some promise to come in terms of the future growth rates of that business. Uh, in terms of the IFT and uh, set-top box diagnostics, uh, the uh, big piece of news during the period um, has been the extension of uh, a large contract for us um, with Liberty Global, who bought Virgin Media, and that's extended a uh, contract that was due to terminate in 2016 by another two years and pushing that out to 2018. That's been welcome and is important. Uh, in terms of digital care, and to remind you, digital care is our insurance management business. This is a business we've built from scratch uh, in, in the building process. Uh, we've taken operating losses as we've begun to put the product together and then the systems and then finally won the contracts we have been implementing during the first half of this year. And I'm pleased to say that in December we broke even uh, with the business and we're expecting it to start contributing from December onwards uh, as it is indeed doing. Uh, in terms of the size of the business, um, it's been focused on Poland. We've won three of the four network operators there, uh, which is quite an achievement from a sales point of view. Uh, we've uh, got in, in, in house some 450, 500,000 uh, policies written today. Um, to be clear, we're not the underwriter in these, we're an organizer. So the other counterpart is 
for us are an underwriter who takes the risk and the, the network operator typically who's the route to the client and, um, and they're selling this screen protection policy alongside um, the, uh, the contract uh, for minutes or indeed the, uh, the mobile. We're getting great attachment rates. Um, it's seen as an innovative um, insurance solution. Um, and in the second half of this year, our focus is very much on validating this at scale. With those network operator contracts, one, uh, we believe that we can, within Poland, um, build the business um, three or four times the size that it's currently at. And certainly, as we run through to the end of this financial year, we'll be pushing towards a million policies. So validation at scale in the second half of this year if that validates as we expect it to, uh, there is a good pipeline of demand in other uh, geographic territories of a similar makeup to Poland. Uh, moving on, you'll recall Excalibur is an, our mobile diagnostics business, um, a, an innovative uh, software um, allowing you to diagnose your mobile either um, from an app on your mobile or remotely or indeed through a t kiosk in the uh, in the retail environment and um, this is something we invested in um, some time ago with a 15% stake uh, as we saw trials coming on board and the uh, software beginning to work and look interesting to customers we upped the stake to 49% with an option to um, uh, take control of the business uh, with a, six, a further 11% taking us to 60%. Um, I'm delighted to say that in the last five weeks we've signed two material new contracts uh, for Excalibur. Uh, one is in the US um, and one is with an OEM manufacturer um, in Asia. Uh, they're both material and significant multi-year contracts, uh, so a very helpful validation. Uh, I think it's fair to say these are the first two cabs off the rank, if you like, um, there's a good uh, number to follow. And it would be unusual, I think, in these circumstances if we weren't expecting to see um, some more of these coming through uh, over the next few weeks. And as they do, uh, we'll let you know about them. In terms of the financials, you won't see this in the P&L at the moment because it's a minority interest. Um, but as the thing breaks through to profits, we would anticipate consolidating it and, under, uh, and, uh, and buying in the option. Um, to take it to 60%. In terms of the growth of advanced solutions, um, I've laid out on, um, on page 8 what you can see there, uh, perhaps starting at the easiest line, um, the growth in margin, which I've pointed out. It's a nice trend. Um, Blanco boosting margins to 20% um, plus in this period. Uh, in terms of the revenue and operating profit, um, they have moved uh, hand in hand. Um, and certainly compared to a year ago, uh, you've got very material growth, whether you're looking uh, in constant currency or reported currency. In reported currency terms, a revenue up 42% and profits up 73% with the constant currency numbers being higher than that. Compared to the last six month period, um, the revenues are down and the reason for that uh, is that during uh, the second half of uh, 2014, we closed down um, some of our UK facilities uh, because the business there um, was not profitable enough and in fact some of those pieces of business were loss making and we felt uh, we were being busy fools whilst there was other good, op good opportunity elsewhere. Sorry, I've got completely off track. In fact, what we closed down was the re-commerce business. I'm going to come to the depot business shortly. And so within the second half of 2014, you'll see that 30 million of revenue um, includes an element of re-commerce. It was profitable business in that period. And I'll show you the trend on the next page as to how that's uh, affected the underlying profitability of the business. If you turn over that next page, um, you'll see on the left-hand side of the page uh, the progression of margins over the period. Um, there's a period of two years here in which margins have doubled from about 10% um, in the advanced solutions uh, division, which has become software and advanced solutions. So that's a, a very pleasing progress. On the right-hand side of the page, uh, what we've done here is to make some adjustments to show you what the underlying operating profit of the business um, has been, or at least the business uh, won in that period as a, an underlying trend. So you'll see the reported hot numbers across the top line, which we've picked up from the last page. Um, I referred to uh, re-commerce. 
Um, and indeed, in the second half of 2014, you'll see that the business of e-commerce made 1.2 million of operating profits, and I've deducted those out as that business has now been closed. Um, on the Blanco business, um, there's a new accounting standard that as a result of being a publicly quoted company, we're obliged to apply to Blanco, and that uh, requires us to take the IFRS revenue recognition standard um, and apply it to all the subscription revenues within Blanco. The subscription revenues um, represent something less than half of the business uh, in Blanco, and those subscription contracts could be one, two or three year contracts. As a result of the revenue recognition, um, what you now have to do is to take the contract um, and the amount of the contract and divide it by the number of months um, that the contract exists for. That's in contrast to the volume business, um, which may be for 10,000 or 150,000 erasures and is bought spot and which we can recognize the re re revenue as soon as the contract um, is signed. The consequences of that revenue recognition is that a, a million pounds of both revenue and operating profit that would historically for Blanco have fallen in the first half of 2015 is now pushed out into the second half of 2015. I've, I've made that distinction for you um, most importantly uh, because you'll see in the waiting between the first half and the second half or the anticipated second half um, of our earnings um, we've delivered six million of operating profit and it leaves a much larger second half to go after and get. Um, this million pounds of profit is already in the bag as a result of business one in the first half and we take it into the second half um, leaving the growth required uh, which is going to come from a combination of Blanco um, growing the digital care business contributing and indeed some of the uh, depots which have recently been started and going from operating losses to operating profits. Those three things have been the big drivers um, of the increase in profitability in the second half. Hopefully I've made that clear and I'm sorry for that slip. Um, so I've mentioned software and advanced solutions has become the largest part of the business also the fastest growing part of the business and in terms of what you can expect out of this I think the story is much less about revenues because the revenues in this part of the business are a minority of the uh, whole uh, but what you can expect is double digit operating profit growth as well as improving margins as a result of this mix and um, coming through on software and advanced solutions. On the depot side of the business um, Let's look at the uh, figures first, um, and what you'll see here is um, a, uh, a considerable growth over the prior six-month period. Um, growth in, in the business in the second half of 2014 um, was down versus the first half of 2014 as a result of closing that UK business that I referred to earlier, um, which was either low or no margin business. Um, we're very pleased that, that uh, the revenue has been replaced uh, by better quality um, business one in the rest of the world and with new clients uh, and in fact that growth um, in, in comparison with the last six months in constant currency terms uh, is nearly 30% in reported terms about 18. Um, you'll see that again reflected in the operating profit line. Versus one year ago um, the business is either plus or minus a few percentage points, again, depending on whether you're looking at reported or, or constant currency. Uh, but the additional piece of encouraging news in this first half is that the new business one, which is not all fully reflected in the first half of 2015, uh, was a total of £32 million. And you can expect to see that um, coming through in terms of the full annualised value of that new business one in the second half of this year and then again into the first half of 2016 as the business ramps up and gains profitability uh, and, it, and as the volume comes into us um, based on those contracted arrangements. Uh, in terms of the, uh, I referred to the new factories and uh, geographic locations where we're moving from operating losses to profits. Um, those new facilities were in Memphis, in Portugal and in the Czech Republic. Um, collectively, they represented about half a million pounds of operating losses in the first half of this year. We expect them collectively to break even in the second half of this year. 
I think the final thing to say on depot solutions um, is that, as I mentioned earlier, having got the geographic footprint that we were looking for, and I believe probably the best geographic footprint in the sector globally, um, I think we can see a period where we'll have reduced change, uh, which will be good for the business in terms of uh, change bringing costs with it. And so we could, should be able to expect the reduced costs of change and in, increased efficiency coming through as a result of the IC, IT systems being rolled out across all of these territories. Turning over once more to look at the underlying trend, and I think you'll find this helpful. If you look at the depot division um, across the last uh, five halves, you'll see in operating profit or hop terms, um, that's been uh, very stable, approximately four million pounds a half, and with the margin um, being broadly similar across the period. What that disguises underneath is a change in the portfolio of the clients, which is quite important to understand. If you went back to 2014 and looked at the uh, deck of cards, if you like, uh, which we acquired and the group of clients, um, there were two weaknesses to it. One was um, that uh, we had a large client in Nokia and the other was we had a large client in RIM. And secondly, um, we had this piece of UK business that represented about a third of the business in depot, um, which was either no or low profit. We closed down that depot business in the UK and Nokia and RIM, despite us uh, achieving more of their business, um, reduced their market share and as a portion of our depot business, it shrunk such that from 2013, when our revenues were broadly the same as revenues in depot in 2015, what was 60% of our business has reduced to about 16% of that depot business. The knock-on of that, of course, is that the 40% of the business on which we have concentrated, which includes other territories and the broader portfolio of clients, has actually grown very rapidly. And it's that business that we expect to continue to grow out and gives us some confidence um, about the longevity and the basis of growth for this business going forward. So that business grew from what was 40% of depot to 84% of depot today, representing a 30 to 40% per annum growth rate over the period. So quite an exciting growth rate going on under here, and indeed a better portfolio of clients as we go into 2016. Jog, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about the numbers in detail. Thanks, Matthew. I'm on slide 12. Um, I said I'd explain a little bit um, about the uh, foreign exchange, but before I go into that, I just wanted to explain a little bit about the shape of the profit between H1 and H2. Reported 6 million of headline operating profit after corporate costs in H1. The market is calling for about 16 million of hot for the full year, so that leaves us 10 million to deliver in H2. Um, a growth from 6 to 10, I suppose, does look ambitious, but it's worth just uh, touching on the point Ma Matthew made earlier about the Blanco revenue recognition issue. That has artificially depressed the H1 profit by a million, so the underlying number was near a 7 million for H1. And therefore, the target for H2 becomes near a sort of 9 million because we've already got 1 million in the bag. So you can see so from an underlying point of view, growing from 6 to 10 looks ambitious, but when you take account of the Blanco revenue recognition issue, it looks more like a growth from 7 to 9. And those growths will come from the growth in the digital care business and the other business units that Matthew talked about. The second thing I thought I'd talk about is the foreign exchange pressure. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's important to note that 90% of the group's revenue and profit isn't in sterling. So the first 50% of the group's revenue and profit is in euros and Polish as lotti. And those currencies have depreciated against sterling by about 10% in the last 12 months, and more recently, about 5%. I put the graphs in slide 22 in the appendix, and you can have a look at those later. The next 40% of the group's revenue is a basket of emerging market currencies. So if you think of South African Rand, Romanian Lao, Indian Rupee, Mexican Peso, and they have also depreciated against the pound by about 8%. Let me just explain what that means. So if you take a country like Spain where the revenue is in euros and the costs are in euros and the profit we generate are in euros, because the euro has declined against the pound, what we have to do is run 10% harder 
and deliver 10% more profit in Spain just to stand still when we report that to you, our shareholders, and the city when we report because we report in sterling. That foreign exchange pressure hasn't gone away um, and it's affecting a number of other co co uh, companies. If you look at the underlying growth rates in constant currency, you can see that they're very much ahead year on year and we're pleased about that. The foreign currency pressure has been about 10 to 15 percent of our profit for this period. And if the foreign currency hadn't moved against us, instead of reporting 6 million, we'd reported near 6.7 million. So it is a significant headwind. If I look further down the profit and loss account, you can see acquisition costs is broadly in line with the same period last year. Um, exceptional restructuring costs. Um, we, if, we, we incurred nothing in H114. We incurred about 400k in H115. Most of that was as a result of the restructuring that we did at the end of 2014, and some of those costs dripped through to the current period. The other thing we're touching on is the tax rate. Uh, the tax rate on our profit is generally about 10 to 12 percent. It's a lot lower than you would expect because we're able to benefit from a number of different things. For example, something called the patent box regime, which allows us to claim a 10 percent corporation tax rate and all that R&D related income. Um, we've also been able to benefit from R&D tax credits and we are in low tax jurisdictions. The tax being low is a permanent benefit and a cash benefit going forward. If I turn the page to the balance sheet on slide 13, you can see that the balance sheet hasn't moved all that much year on year. The items that I tend to focus on are the starred items, and you can see our capital employed has gone up a small amount. Uh, return on capital employed remains strong, and if you look at the working capital items specifically, which are the stock, the debtors, and the creditors, you can see the net investment in working capital is eight million pounds, um, and on an annualised two hundred million revenue business, you can see that represents less than five percent of revenue, so it remains very well managed and very tightly controlled. On slide fourteen, I've put a very simple schedule that shows how our cash position has moved during the period. On the left hand side, we started the year with twenty million of cash. On the right hand side. We ended the six-month period with 12 million of cash. The first half of this graph shows what's happened from a trading perspective. We've generated cash uh, from our operations and we've invested in working capital. The net cash generated from operations I measure by looking at the cash conversion on HOP. That is a 70% conversion that we've generated. I'm pleased with that because, as I mentioned earlier, it's back to normal levels. And I also mentioned that is against the context of pressure from our clients, where a number of our clients are saying to us we prefer longer credit terms, and we've had to give them those credit terms and absorb that pressure. The other thing that we've had is our business has moved more towards emerging markets, and naturally the working capital cycle in those countries tends to be longer. So we've absorbed those pressures and returned back to a normal 70% cash conversion. And we've done that by being tight and managing the working capital very sensibly. If I move to the right hand side of the graphs, these are our sort of investment activities and arguably a bit more discretionary. So on the CapEx and R&D, we've actually almost doubled the investment in CapEx R&D. And I'm pleased to be able to do that because it is commensurate for us, for a business of our size, to reinvest in the business today for benefit for the future. 60% of that investment in CapEx and R&D is on the intangible side, and um, that is across uh, our mobile business, our IFT business, and our software business, where we have engineers in different countries inventing new equipment, uh, new technology to be rolled out over the next three to five years. We did four small acquisitions in the period, um, leading to a small cash outflow there. Um, and uh, we ended the period of 12 million of cash. To remind you, we have 30 million of unused bank facilities. So with the cash that's sitting in the bank of the unused facilities, that gives me about 40 million of cash to continue to invest, either organically or through M&A. On slide 15, what I've done here is just summarize the current portfolio of products and services in our business on the left hand side chart and on the right hand side chart present a possible vision for the future. 
The graphs are illustrative, um, but generally, if you consider the size of the blobs, the green blobs, to be illustrative of the profit contribution of those businesses. On the left-hand side chart is, uh, if you look at the, the y-axis, which is the one on, on the left-hand side, that is a, a representation of what the operating margins are in those businesses, and it's on a log scale. On the x-axis, which is at the bottom, this shows the revenue growth for those business units that we've seen. Again, it's on a log scale. Then if you compare the left-hand side chart with the right-hand side chart, and you'll see the movement in those bubbles representing what we think could happen for the future. You'll see the depot business remains fairly consistent, um, growing very slightly, but remaining steady in terms of margin and growth rates being you know, low single digits and more mid single digits. And the depot business is important as it gives us access to our clients, it represents the backbone of the business and gives us the opportunity to sell the advanced solutions and software services. Those other services are the other blobs. As you'll see Blanco and Excalibur moving together into one blob and integrating together to become part of the software solution. You'll see that blob growing very dramatically, both in terms of profit contribution and in terms of higher revenue growth and higher operating margin. The digital care insurance business that Matthew mentioned earlier, you can see the profit contribution from that is small at the moment, but we believe that has good growth potential, both in Poland and other countries. And finally, the IFT remote diagnostics business. Um, at the moment, it's, the blob is pretty small and the growth has been high. We would expect that business to mature, the growth rates to slow down, but the profit contribution to increase. I'm going to now pass to Matthew, who will give you a bit more detail about these. Jock, thank you very much. Um, so to finish up, I think what Jog's communicating is that on the depot side, you can look at it as steady as we go, um, a business with good market position um, and nice financial characteristics. The growth that we're talking about here um, in terms of uh, operating margin and operating profit is principally being fueled um, by the software and advanced solutions business. And what I thought I would do, um, because some of these businesses are at a relatively early stage um, and on quite steep trajectories as we've seen on the past page, I would outline what sort of bronze, silver and gold um, would look like in terms of the medal stakes for achievement uh, in the three or four key parts sitting under this uh, business. And I'll rattle through these. I think it's suffice to say that from a budgeting perspective, we're looking at these uh, uh, the, from a budgeting perspective, we're looking at a sort of bronze scenario on a conservative basis to budget. Silver is what we're targeting and stretching the salespeople and business people to, and gold's a multi-year view. Um, we've told you that we're growing Blanco currently at around 20% per annum on the revenue line uh, with accelerating growth rates, and 30% uh, is certainly within scope. Um, has work to do, but certainly looking into next year, you could see that uh, as a quite possible outcome. Uh, in terms of more exceptional growth than, growth than that, we've bought the Safe IT business and we have this data erasure management, which is an enterprise level um, solution which has begun to sell well um, with corporates. If those bite in the way that we would expect them to, you could see that growth rate going up towards 50%. And then finally, um, if we're to achieve takeoff and this is to become a very large and very valuable business, um, you'd expect to see this going out um, with more enterprise style products and through a channel strategy. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we've got a new chief executive on board. This is very much what he's working on in the mo at the moment. In digital care, um, I've given you a pretty clear view of where we are in uh, Poland, uh, bronze is to deliver what we've contracted to deliver, uh, which clearly is within scope. Um, if we do that, as I've said, in the second half of this year, we can start to look at the second lot of territories, which would be silver. And if we start to achieve the kind of profits that we might expect out of Poland and those other territories, we'll then have a very profitable business, as indicated by the bubbles uh, Jog was talking about. Should we get to that point, we should start looking at turning that into a, a sustainable market leadership position and to diversify the products into a suite of products for device insurance rather than the single um, screen protection that we have at the moment. In set-top box, we've got two big clients to follow rollouts with, Liberty Global uh, and uh, our client in the US. 
Um, bronze would be rolling out with one of them, silver would be rolling out with both, and clearly a, a larger group of clients would represent um, a gold outcome. I think it's fair to say Excalibur, it's a little early to say, uh, and so I won't dwell on that. Just turning to the outlook and some conclusions, I think you'll have picked up our outlooks positive. Um, we've remained confident about uh, the expectations um, for the year, so we expect the year's result to be in line with market expectations. Uh, we're expecting further growth from the group, group in terms of profit margin, but also in terms of the value that we're able to create for shareholders. And so you should expect to see a double-digit growth coming through from headline operating profit. Uh, that's the remainder of the presentation. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Andy, over to you for questions. Well, thank you very, both very much for uh, a very useful and slightly different insight to the business, uh, which I'm sure everybody appreciated. Uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, if we go through perhaps the ones relating to some of the divisions first and, and then the bigger picture. Uh, firstly, on Excalibur, Mark is curious, without you giving a, a prediction, how soon you might exercise the remaining call option on Excalibur uh, now that it seems to be very much living up to its potential and achieving commercial revenues? Um, I think it's quite possible that happens in 2016. Um, we'd certainly be hopeful of that. Uh, it may be a little longer than that. Okay, thank you. Um, Depot, um, first of all, we have a question from Bruce. Um, about what you regard as good growth uh, in, in the statement, but I, I suspect that may well have been answered in terms of looking at the investment made and the fact that you are now uh, harvesting you know, the relationships that have been built up. There will be less change and less cost as a result of that, so you're in a better position moving forward. I'm, yes. an, I'm answering the questions now. So, uh, well, look, to be clear, um, I'm not sure whether the question is focused mm -hmm. on uh, the period just gone or the mm -hmm. period looking forward. Uh, I think we've achieved good growth. Um, I think that's uh, um, pretty clear in the underlying numbers, certainly in constant currency. They stand out in the depot. I think looking forward um, would guide you to a more modest outlook. Um, in the past, we've had about half of our growth coming from acquisition about half of it from organic growth. If you look at those prior periods, you can certainly see sort of 6% organic growth as being something we've achieved um, reasonably uh, regularly through the prior periods, and that would not be a bad basis to start working on. Okay, and uh, following on from that, Ilias notes what Jog said about Depot being the, the backbone and the access point for other products to be sold to, to clients, but have you considered separating depot out from the software solution side where where growth uh, does appear to be very attractive at the moment and therefore might reflect hidden value um well without being flippant we've only just put them together <laughs> it may be a little early to be thinking about that um look uh, right now the two parts of the business are clearly benefiting from some strong sales synergies um they do have different values and different growth rates. Um, I think we'd like to see those benefits flow through. The clients are liking it. Um, and let's revisit that question in the, in the fullness of time. Okay. Um, on Blanco, a um, couple of questions. First of all, uh, with any M&A, there's usually surprises. It does seem, from what we've heard, that most of them have been good rather than bad at the moment, so do you therefore look back at the price that you paid and regard it as a, a very good transaction for shareholders? Uh, resoundingly, yes. Okay. And then in terms of the, uh, the switch to subscription uh, model for Blanco clients, uh, how are the clients themselves reacting? Are they actually embracing it as a, a chance to save them from making upfront lump sum expenditures? I, I don't think, uh, to, to characterize that we've taken a specific client and switched them from an upfront payment method to a subscription method, that's actually not what's happened. What's happened is it's actually two different types of clients. So the, the client that is buying Blanco to erase laptops because at the, the end of the life or they're recycling the laptop or um, they're you know, going to dispose of it, they tend to buy the Blanco uh, uh, Blanco software on the pay up front model. The different type of client is the corporate client and these are names that you would know professional services, businesses and banks 
and they are buying Blanco on the subscription model because they've got thousands of laptops, thousands of employees with thousands of mobiles, and they tend to use the product all the time, not just at the end of the life, but throughout its life. And what, when we're saying you've seen a switch, what you're actually seeing is a growth in the corporate market and a corporate client base. So what we're actually seeing is that being a bigger proportion of the revenue uh, rather than any switch from a customer paying up front to subscription. Um, so I, I don't think that's actually the right question. Okay. And in terms of uh, Blanco's pricing structure, at the time of the acquisition, you were hopeful of, of feeding through price increases, uh, recognising that you've still not controlled the business for a, a full year yet, but uh, are you still as hopeful or indeed impl impl uh, implicating some of those changes now? Uh, indeed, we've put a price rise through in September. Um, it was one of um, a stage series of changes that we plan to make. Um, some of those are still to come. Um, the price rise landed well. I think it's fair to say that our focus was um, at the top end of our product range, so not in the volume piece that um, Jog has been talking about, but with this corporate group which represent um, slightly less than 50% of uh, the revenues of the business. Um, we'd expect to see that phase in. That happens to be with the subscription style of revenue. So you'll see the benefit of that coming in on a monthly basis as those uh, higher price subscriptions um, phase in through the revenue. Uh, we're very optimistic and we continue to be optimistic that there's more to come there. Uh, I think the clever way to introduce those uh, rises will be as part of bundled new product releases of which there are several that are both um, have both been launched and are on their way. Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, leading neatly, neatly on from the positive outlook there and indeed within your, uh, your statement this week uh, a fairly robust outlook for uh, the rest of, of 2015 and looking forward um, and looking back to January when there was a trading update uh, about performance being in line with expectations. Uh, we have seen a share price decline on the back of the results uh, as indeed happened uh, six months ago. How would you explain that uh, and is that a mismatch of, of board and analyst expectations? Uh, I don't believe it's a mismatch of board and analyst expectations, um, certainly not to my perception. Uh, how would I explain it? Uh, I, I am, there are more sellers than buyers, I suppose, is, uh, is the short answer. Um, do I think it's um, fairly reflecting the results? Uh, no, it's disappointing, it's frustrating. Um, but what is very clear, um, and I am clear about, is that the business that we have today is in better shape than it has ever been in. And in terms of where this business stands today, um, versus the day on which we raised the money for Blanco, um, it is considerably de-risked by um, not having to worry about uh, onboarding Blanco well or not having bought what we thought we were buying. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, um, we've also improved the portfolio of the depot clients in the way that I described. We've brought Excalibur right to the verge of uh, being economically uh, profitable and beginning to pick up some um, real uh, pace and digital care through the break-even. Um, to my mind, and certainly in the way that I look at businesses, uh, we have got a much more valuable business with considerable promise and indeed growing earnings. Um, so it's disappointing. Um, it's for you as the shareholders to judge um, what the right price is because ultimately you set it. Okay, and perhaps to finish up with the last one, it's about three questions in here, but uh, uh, following on from that, Paul is saying on the face of it, um, you are now looking set for substantial double-digit double earnings per share growth um, on a price earnings ratio that next year is probably in, in single figures now. Um, I think, Jog, you mentioned the dilutory effects of having cash on the balance sheet, having raised more money than was required just for the Blanco transaction. So how might we see that cash uh, used in, in the near future? Is there another potential Blanco size deal out there? Is it more likely to be bolt-on acquisitions, in which case can we expect you know, one or two before uh, the, the end of calendar? 2015 
uh, or is it the case of perhaps more share buybacks using the cash debt? Let me at least start with some of it. I mean, on the acquisition side, uh, I, I don't think you should expect a, another Blanco, although given what I said, if somebody offered us one, I think we'd be very pleased <laughs> to have it. Um, so if you know of one, let's, let us know. Um, it, uh, the, the pipeline has got a series of bolt-on acquisitions. We've made a lot of them. Uh, they're not bet the farm deals. Um, they integrate and, uh, uh, and across the board they've been um, uh, very um, relatively low risk um, and good things to add in terms of the range of services to the clients. I think you've picked up that's not our focus of attention is not going to be on the depot side. Uh, we are not out looking for new territories, although I wouldn't rule it out on, a, on an opportunistic basis. Uh, the focus in this last period has been rounding out um, the Blanco proposition. We've brought in some minorities around the sales office. We've brought in the Safe IT. I think you should expect to see more of the same. Um, and uh, I would not be surprised to see um, some further progress uh, on that during the course of the next six months or so. Uh, but M&A is M&A. Uh, we're not entirely in control. Um, and so uh, we can just work towards that goal. Um, on, do you want to speak at all on the uh, on the prospects for the use of other cash? The uh, I suppose the opportunities are around investing in capex and R and D and organic growth. Our return on capital employed is sixty or seventy percent uh, on an incremental you know pound spent. So what does that mean if I, if I spend a pound today, I should get a pound seventy back in twelve months' time? And, and that's a good investment, both from a capex point of view or in working capital, and we have an opportunity to do that um, at the moment. Uh, the growth areas are on the advanced solutions and software side of the business. They're not hugely working capital intensive, or, although we have invested a little bit more in R&D, as I talked about earlier. And let me address the question on the share buyback, because I, I, I don't want to dodge it, although I'm not going to answer it very directly. Uh, we have the capacity to do share buybacks. Uh, it's clearly something that the board needs to look at from time to time, and we will do that. Great. And very quickly, uh, Jogger, are you able to say what uh, euro sterling rate your divisions have budgeted for in the second half? Um, yeah, so uh, we have assumed 1.34 euros to the pound. Um, and just to give you an idea of the metrics, 50% uh, of the revenue is euro and zloty. Okay, thank you. And absolutely, last one from Richard, just on uh, IFT. Um, lots of excitement elsewhere in the group. It, would it be fair to say that IFT is a little muted, perhaps by Liberty's um, uh, ongoing um, uh, activity in Europe itself and the, the US opportunity has been delayed it seems for a little while but do you remain still positive looking forward? I think it's fair to say it's slower than we would have hoped uh, or, or indeed liked. Um, the opportunity um, the opportunity is still there uh, in exactly the way that we described it in terms of the US is performing uh, in line with the client's expectation and our promise, we're pleased with it. Uh, the Liberty Global thing is interesting, it's a moving feast. Um, they do more deals than we do, so it's quite difficult to keep up with what is a unified European plan. Um, both those things are very much in the offing for next year. Um, at the moment we don't have exact timetables, so we're being patient whilst working very closely with them.